Welcome back to Logic 101, I'm William Spaniel, and today we are proving biconditional tautologies. In theory, you already know everything you need to be able to prove a biconditional tautology. However, there is a very specific recipe you should always use whenever you encounter one of these, and that's the subject of today's lecture. Let's do this by example. Imagine you want to show that P if and only if P or Q and not Q is true. This is a biconditional because we have the if and only if operator, and it's a tautology because we have no premises to work with. So how do we go about doing this? Well, our three-step recipe is as follows. First, you're going to use a conditional proof for the if-then part of the biconditional statement. Then you're going to use a second separate conditional proof for what we refer to as the only if part of the biconditional. That's essentially flip-flopping the antecedent and the consequent. You'll see it in a second. Then you're going to tie those two things together with biconditional introduction, and at that point, you're done. So to illustrate, first we're going to show that P implies P or Q and not Q. That's essentially erasing the biconditional and replacing it with a conditional statement. Then after we've done that, we're going to flip-flop the ordering, so we're showing that P or Q and not Q implies P. And then after we've done those two things, supposing that they appear on lines 3 and 8, we're going to conclude our proof by citing lines 3 and 8 and by conditional introduction, which gets us exactly what we want to get. But the recipe provides more specific guidelines than just that. It not only tells us that we need to prove those two conditional statements, it tells us how we should try to do that. We should use a conditional proof. The reason is as follows. If you're in a proof and you want to show a conditional statement, imagine that this isn't a biconditional statement that we want to prove, it's just a single conditional statement that we want to prove. The easiest way of going about doing that is to use a conditional proof. Here, when we're focusing on a biconditional statement, we have essentially doubled the task. We have two implications to prove, not just one. But that doesn't change how we should be proving each of those individual conditional statements. We should prove each of those individual conditional statements with its own conditional proof. So let's go ahead and start doing that for the first conditional statement. P implies P or Q and not Q. The way we use a conditional proof is to assume the antecedent is true. The antecedent here is P. And then the goal for the conditional proof is to show that if you assume that P is true, then the consequent must be true as well, P or Q and not Q. And in fact, this is very easy to do. If you know that P is true, disjunction introduction allows you to tack on anything else and that statement will be true, right? If P is true, then P or literally anything else is true as well. Here, we have a very specific anything else that we want to put in there. That's the consequent of the statement, which is P or Q and not Q. And so that's what we have. We're done. It's that simple. We have our implication right there. We close the conditional proof. We cite lines one and two, and we have P implies P or Q and not Q. So that part was actually pretty easy, and I'm hoping that you figured out how to do that one on your own. The second one is going to be a little bit more complicated. So we have as our second conditional statement, P or Q and not Q implies P. We still should be using a conditional proof for this. So line four is the antecedent of that implication, P or Q and not Q. And this is going to be our assumption for our conditional proof. Now here is a good time for you to pause this video and think about this one on your own. So maybe pause this video, spend a few minutes figuring out how you can show if you assume P or Q and not Q is true, that P must be true as well. So go ahead, stop this video for a moment, think about that. If you have an answer, go ahead and type it in to the comments section below. And if you have done that, let's go about doing this. So when I see this, the first thing that's going off in my mind is that the second half of the disjunction can't possibly be true. Q and not Q is itself a contradiction. That's like saying you are watching this video and you are not watching this video. That's not possible. 
So it can't ever be true that the second half of this disjunction is true. And if we know that the second half of this of the disjunction can't be true, then it must be the case that the first half of the disjunction is true. So now all we need to use is the logical operators that we know to show that that intuition that we just went over is correct. And if we know that the second half of the disjunction can't be right, it seems like we have a good candidate for a proof by contradiction. So let's assume for the moment that not P is true. If not P is true, then we know in theory that the second half of the disjunction must be true. If not P is true, then through disjunctive syllogism, the second half of line four must be true which is Q and not Q. Of course, that can't possibly be the case. That's itself a contradiction. We don't even have to do any more work. Normally in these proofs by contradiction, we have to do a little bit more work to formally derive a contradiction. But in fact, the contradiction was already given to us built into the system. So at this point, the nested proof that we have for this proof by contradiction is already done. We know that the assumption for the proof by contradiction on line five can't be right. And so that means that instead P must be right. And if P is right, well, now we're done, right? If we have P on a line on this first indentation, our goal for this conditional proof was to assume that P or QN not Q is true and show that P follows as a result of that. And we've just done that. We're done. This is it. It's over. We can now conclude line eight is true using lines four and seven, our conditional proof. We have P or Q and not Q implies P. And that means we're basically done. We have both parts of the biconditional. We have the arrow flowing one way. We have the arrow flowing the other way. And then we simply wrap up this proof using biconditional introduction. So that is our recipe. We first take one half of the biconditional and show that it's true using a conditional proof. We then take the other half of the biconditional and use the same strategy. We use a conditional proof to show that's true. And then we tie them together using biconditional introduction. This is literally the exact way you should be solving every single biconditional tautology whenever you get it. Hope you enjoyed this lecture and hope to see you next time. Take care.